body that sweats like a pig, particularly when I've had a cup of tea and I'm on a very muggy sort of day. And also before I start, I'd like to make a particular announcement for men. The Catholic Church is holding a men's breakfast on the, I think it's the 9th, the 9th, and they've got a very um, specialised speaker and it'll be on men's health issues. So men, I'd love you to be there. It's not that expensive to go for a, a breakfast, but I think it's 7 o'clock, 7.30 at the least. <coughs> Um, information out there. Could you let either Mary or myself know if you'd like to go? We do need to get the numbers in. And it really is great how the, the churches in this area working together. I was talking to the lady on the phone from the Catholic Church yesterday and um, we're just sort of saying, well, the hierarchy can do what they want, but we're going to fellowship yeah. as brothers and sisters. And that's really, really wonderful. Okay, shall we pray? Dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, for the way in which we're able to come in here, Lord, to and set aside our cares and worries of this world and just rest in you. Lord, as we go through your word, help us, Lord, to understand. Help us, Lord, to know how to put it into practice. And help us, Lord, to bring others to know you as Lord and Saviour as we do. Be with us now, in Jesus' blessed name. We have been looking at the book of Galatians and the title of the, the series has been Freedom in Jesus and it's the study of Galatians. Today we're particularly going to look at what does it mean for us today. We've looked at it, we've gone through the six chapters, there has been interpretation, there's been application, but this time we're just going to look at it, what does it really mean for us today? Now up there I have a picture from, <coughs> on a, 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 an art piece, it may have just been a play or it may have been something that was hung on the wall, it's not a coin, of a Galatian, 300 years before Christ. Now when we think of Galatia, and we know where it is in Turkey sort of thing, I guess we, at least I do, tend to think, you know, oh yeah, they're just like that, but they were actually Gauls. And the Gauls come from around the French, the French area, and also England. And they moved across there about 300 BC and, and established. And you've all seen, most of you would have read the, the comic strip. Some of you are probably too young to understand, you know, Asterisk the Gaul. Yeah! And, and um, their life, even in Galatia at that time, was very much like a feudal village. It wasn't in mansions and houses that we would have today. It's like that, and so Paul was writing to them. Now the interesting thing is, the Gauls were famous for the invention of two things. Asterisk, yes, no. The magic potion. And you can tell they were in English. The first thing that they're famous for inventing was soap, and the second is barrels, you know, wooden barrels. Now it's interesting that the, as you're reading Galatia and the, the, the churches in that area, Paul and the other letter writers were often talking about cleanliness. The Gauls were fastidious for cleanliness on the outside. Paul began talking to them about being clean on the inside. And so we're going to have a look at what exactly what um, we have learned in the last six, it's only six chapters, of Galatians. Let's have a look at the next. The first thing that we learned from Galatians was that the way of salvation. There was a, a rich young person came up to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? Galatians very clearly, very forcefully spelled out what we must do to be saved. When we talk about salvation, we mean being saved from something for something. And we are being saved from our sin, from our separation from God, being saved for God, to be his sons, his daughters, his heirs. And so that's what we've got to do to be saved. And the interesting thing that we learned is that people cannot save themselves, 
we learn that, the, that uh, the cross is God's way and we are justified through faith and God's grace is the only basis for salvation. There's not one thing you or I can do to be saved. There's not one thing that we can do. And yet, as, as human beings, we expect that we sh should be able to do something to get something. We often get very embarrassed when someone wants to give us a gift that we think, wow, it's a pretty big gift, you know, I couldn't take get embarrassed. We're not prepared as people to accept it. Our pride or whatever it is, stands in the way. But with salvation, our pride can stand in the way, but there's no other way to do it but to accept God's grace. Let's have a look. People cannot save themselves, and it was found in 1 Galatians chapter 4. And it tells us very clearly, Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God the Father. Jesus gave himself to rescue us. Gave, gave, gave himself to rescue. Just those words tell us something that God did that Jesus did, put his life in peril, in danger, to rescue us. We need to come to that place of realisation that that's what God has done for us. And it wasn't just Jesus. It was done in accordance with the will of the Father. Now that's interesting. It was done in accordance with the will of the Father of the Father. When you might be on the beach and see people drowning and there's four people out there all drowning at once and you're one person and you go and randomly choose someone to rescue. You think, wow, why did you choose me? Why did you choose me? Mm -hmm. You see, we got chosen because God loved us so much that he wanted you and me to be his sons and his daughters and he wanted to show, shower every single blessing on us. God chose us. We have been chosen to be in the number one team. You've been chosen, I've been chosen. It wasn't a random thing that just happened. God deliberately and specifically chose you and me. We also found out that the cross is God's way. He didn't do it by waving a magic wand. He didn't do it by allowing three turkeys to fly in the air. He did it his way, which is the way of the cross. And this is what Paul said to the Galatians. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are following a different gospel, not that there really is another gospel, but there are some who are disturbing you and wanting to distort the gospel of Christ. The fact that God chose you the fact that God chose me and the fact that he used the cross tells us if God chose the cross, then there could not have been any other way. Because if there was any other way to save you and me, would he have put his own son, allowed his own son to go through hell, to die, to surrender his majesty in heaven, come and dwell with the riffraff. If there was any other way, God would have used it. But there was no other way. And so the cross is God's way and the cross is the only way. If there was another way, then all of Christ's dying was useless and vain. And Paul is pointing to the people, and I guess he's pointing to us today, do not desert do not believe what you were first taught. Do not believe it. You can be disturbed, you can be distorted by what other people tell you. But Paul said the message from the beginning, the message of the, of the apostles, the message I give you, it is the only message. When you hear all these things from other great preachers or whatever, go back and check it with the Bible. Do not 
believe what you first learned. And then we also learn in 2.16, we are justified through faith. Yet we know that no one is justified by the works of the law, but by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by the faithfulness of Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. There will be arguments, and I'll explain a little bit later on. There will be arguments about, well, yep, we know we've been saved by, by grace, by the Lord Jesus Christ. But surely we've still got to keep some of the law. It only makes sense to keep some of the law because some of that law is good. But no, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says very clearly, very unequivocally, that we are set free. We are not bound by the law. We are not saved by the law. And nor do we need, need, I don't want the word need, to keep the law. And Paul gave a great example of himself. See, Paul was an expert in the law. He'd gone through the schools and the traditions and had reached probably the highest rank as a scholar in the law. Absolutely. And he was righteous. And he saw himself righteous under the law. But in that righteousness, he persecuted Christians. At the height of his righteousness, he was so far against God that he was persecuting those who believed in God. The law did not save him. Following the law for Paul was proven to be wrong. And he, he discovered he had a hallelujah moment on the road to Damascus. There is nothing I can do to put me right with God. And there's nothing I can do. Nothing I can do. <coughs> but listen to God. No one can be justified. None of my actions can be justified by the law. And what we go on in this, God's grace is the only basis for salvation. Chapter 3, verses 6 to 9. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, so then, understand that those who believe are the sons of Abraham. Did Abraham come to know God because he kept the law? No. The law wasn't even in existence. There was a covenant of faith between Abraham and God. And Abraham believed what God was going to be faithful and what he was going to keep for the future through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But there came a, a, a time whereby law was brought in because God wanted to show the rest of the world the way in which people should live in the Jews were, were chosen by God to be that example for the rest of the world. And the only way that they could do it was by keeping certain laws and, and, and regimentation that God had put in place. And they did it so well that no one took any notice of it. So we had a period before the law, which was justification by faith. Abraham showed that. Then we had the law, we had to try and keep the rights and the rules and the law. And then we had Jesus Christ. He put all that away. He put all that aside. And so we were, we were set free. We were free to do whatever we wanted to do. Now, I'm going to put a little right under that. We were set free to do whatever we wanted to do. And Paul goes on and tells us that there is something special about this freedom. Let's have a look. First of all, we find that God wants us to have a basis for Christian relationships. How we get on with one another. And as we look at this relationship as how we get on to one another, we will see how we need to live our life. Not bound by the law, but we see the principles guidelines that 
we need to be mindful of. Not that we follow them, because I'm going to tell you a little trick in a minute that God did for us. You know, as we get older, and as Don, Don said it there earlier on, he can't remember how long he's been married because his, his memory's far. <laughs> no, I don't remember that one, Don. Um, but he, God gave us a little trick to help us with our memory. But before we get on that, we're going to talk about Christian relationship. God is no respecter of persons. Let's have a look what it says there in 3.14. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles so that we could receive the promise of the Spirit by faith. Abraham was blessed. We are sharing through Jesus Christ in the blessing of Abraham. We are not sharing in the blessing of the Lord. And the moment we get that through our heads, the moment we will be totally released and we will not be trying to control others in a relationship. We will be loving, we will be gentle, we will be kind. Just as Jesus and God were loving, gentle and kind. We share in the blessing of Abraham, which is the promise and it's through the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't matter whether you're a Gentile or a Jew, a Scotsman, a Dutchman, an Australian, an Aborigine, a German, a Greek, a Galatian, it doesn't matter. God wants us all. We put the class distinctions, the race distinctions on. We should, we should have the eyes of children. I remember teaching a fifth class and in that class we talked, we'd been studying the history of Aborigines and I said to people, in the class, do any of you know an Aboriginal? And they all went, yes, we do. This girl over there. This girl over there was not Aboriginal. She was Sri Lankan. And I said, no, she's not Aboriginal. She's Sri Lankan. And the girl turned to me and I said, you thought that she was Aboriginal because she was dark. And the girl turned to me and said, am I dark? <laughs> Kids have no colour barrier. God has no colour barrier, no race barrier, no creed barrier, no barrier. He loves us all. And Paul said, what I don't understand is I'm the worst of the worst. Mm. I had Christians persecuted and killed for the sake of righteousness. I therefore, I must be the worst. How could God even love me? How could God even love me? Most of us tend to think, oh, we're only a little bit wrong. We're only a little bit out of step with God. Sorry. Just that much away from God is, is a zillion miles away from God. We are the worst, and yet God loved us and God chose us. You see, believers are one in Christ as well. 328. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. For believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is for everyone. And the moment we believe, the moment we believe we are united with him and united with our brothers and sisters. But I take you to any church, including ours, and are we really united? Sure we can have discussion, sure we can have disagreement, but are we united? Are we as one? You see, what had happened was the Jews, Peter and the others, knew about all this and they were happy for general Christians. But then they turned and started keeping the law that said you know, you're not supposed to associate with the Gentiles. And Peter had to take it to task. You convert them, you tell them they don't have to be circumcised, but you won't even go and eat with them. <laughs> See, in the church, in the church, we are one. But do we associate with those that don't wear shoes to church? Do we associate with those who have got money? Do we associate with those who are ugly, or do we associate with those who are beautiful? There is no respecter. 
God has us all and he wants us all to be united. And the conditions for salvation are exactly the same for fellowship. And fellowship means the way in which we love one another. Let's have a look at what it says. I've shortened the verses. But until certain people came from James, he'd been eating with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he stopped doing this and separated himself because he was afraid of those who were pro-circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also joined with him in, the, in this hypocrisy. So that even Barnabas was led astray with them by the hypocrisy. Barnabas was a Greek. But when I saw that they were not behaving consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, if you, although you are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you try to force the Gentiles to live like Jews? You see, they began to go back and start living by some of the law. And, Peter, and Paul was telling Peter and Co, you've got it wrong. Because you are making second class citizens of believers. And that way Paul was able to write to Philemon and talk about Onesimus being his brother. Because there is no respecter of Person. class, race, dress in the fellowship. When you belong to the church, you should know that when you belong to the church and when you meet with your fellow brothers and sisters, you are at peace. You are at rest. You may get kicked in the teeth at work or in the world out there, but at least when you come into the fellowship and meet with the fellowship, you know. <sighs> but too often, too often in churches, and ours included, we come in here and we go, on, ready to walk on eggshells. We should be all coming in and going, <sighs> we're resting in Christ. We're resting in Christ. We also learn that it's the nature of Christian freedom that Paul was talking about. Christians are free from the law. 8 to 11 and 5 to 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. We are not to keep the law. We don't go out of our way to keep the law. It's an irrelevancy. We have been already been blessed under the blessing of Abraham through the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, through the cross. Stop putting rules and regulations on yourself and stop putting rules and regulations on others. What the world does out there, the world does out there because they're away from God. My responsibility is what I do with what I know from what the Lord Jesus Christ, from what God and what the Holy Spirit has led me to do. That's what is important. And I am to set the example. I am to set the example. But I can't do it on my own. And God knows that. And so what did God do? What did God do? We'll find out. Christians are bound by love. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge your flesh. But through love, serve one another. A classic example is this, what's going on now in the Australian men's swimming team. They were chosen. They were the special ones. They'd been picked out and they'd been anointed. They'd been the heirs of success of the Olympic Games. And they go across and they get into camp and they treat everybody else with disrespect. They treat themselves with disrespect. And often when we, as Christians, we treat ourselves and God with disrespect because we take this freedom that we've got for granted and run amok. Well, we've got no rules. We've got no laws to follow. Therefore, I can do anything and everything. As a Christian, there's a difference. You no longer live by the law, you no longer saved by the law, but you have experienced God's love. You've experienced God's blessing. And once you know God's love, and once you know God's blessing, 
guess what? You can't help but share that blessing. You're not worried about being command and controlling others. You're about loving others. And sometimes when you love someone, it hurts, it aches, it pains because they're going the wrong way and everything and anything you can do doesn't seem to work. And all you can seem to do, and David Adams will tell you this one, is pray. And say, God, I can't do this. What's going on? Give me the strength. Give me the patience. More importantly, you, you, take, out, you take control of it. But through love, serve one another. So you see why we don't have to keep the law? Did Jesus keep the law? In a way he did. But he didn't have to keep the law. He was obedient to God. He died and he rose again. What he showed us was love. And the Bible's telling us, love one another. If you love one another, then the law automatically happens because the good things of the law automatically happen because love is the overriding principle. And you see, next one, Christian freedom brings joy and fulfilment. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts who calls Abba Father. So you are no longer a slave but a son. And if you are a son, then you also are an heir through God. What little trick has God done for us? He has put the Holy Spirit into our hearts who knows God as Father. And the Holy Spirit was given to lead us along, moment by moment, day by day, in the right way. No longer do we have to rely on our memory, we rely on the Holy Spirit. And so it is. We rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we feel like, what do we do? We must meditate. Not the spiritual meditation you see at the East. Meditate and say, Lord, what are you telling me? What do you want me to do? Just like Nehemiah, when he went before the king, the Bible tells us as he walked in the king, he chucked a quick prayer to heaven and said, it's all in your hands, God. You see, God knew that we couldn't keep the law. God knew that we want need to live a right life. And so he said, I've given you a companion. I've given you the Holy Spirit that's living in your heart, that's teaching you the right way to go what you should be doing. And guess what? Because you are a son, or because you are a daughter, I've given you this great gift as well, the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Is what he's saying. And the interesting thing is, we find, by the grace of God, I am what I am. 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And I, there's an old Sunday school hymn thing, there's no longer I that live but Christ lives in me. It's one, it's, boy, it's, a, oh, it's a fabulous boys brigade hymn, and it's something that, that just grabs me. And it's so true. In all that we do, we are not reflecting ourselves, we are reflecting Christ. Let's allow Christ to live through us. We don't have to worry about keeping the law because we are allowing Christ to live through us. And I, I live. I live not because of anything that I've done. I live because of the faithfulness and obedience of Jesus Christ. Who loved me and gave himself for me. And so the message to each and every one of us is, are we prepared to love others just as Jesus loved us? Sure, it's easy to love the lovely. It's very hard to love the unlovely. Sure, it's easy to love our neighbours. If they made the lawns for you or slashed their lawns for you on. Um, but it's so hard to love those that you don't know. It's so hard to love the Buddhists, the Muslims, and so on and so forth. The terrorists. It's hard. But irrespective of all that, you know, Jesus died for them as well as he died for us. And it's our job, our responsibility to love one another, particularly in the church, so that others will see us and give glory to God in heaven. And finally, which is all this, if Christ lives in me, then what am I free to do? God so loved, he gave.
you were God and we found you. We thank you, Lord, that you gave us, your son, that we could be free, free from sin. And we thank you, Lord, that you've called us to be your sons and daughters and heirs. Lord, we also thank you that you gave us the Holy Spirit who can teach us, that can walk alongside us, telling us how, how to cry out, Abba, Father. Help us, Lord, to realise that you are our Father and that you want the best for us. 